seen uh, Sid Day's uh, session on uh, gene and genomes at the time of uh, next generation uh, sequencing. So my name is Olivier Delano. I'm an assistant professor at um, the Department of Computational Biology of the University of uh, Lausanne. And today I will be co-chairing this session uh, with the help of uh, Natasha. Natasha. Hi, I'm Natasha Glover. I'm a postdoc in the lab of Christophe Desimo, also at the University of Lausanne. So, a few remarks before we start. So, so far we've got uh, 96 uh, attendees, which is good, 97. Uh, we've got also four talks of 12 minutes uh, each, plus uh, three minutes questions. I kindly ask the presenters to uh, stick, uh, to respect the 12 minutes as we are a bit tight on schedule. And uh, for the attendees now, uh, during the presentation, you will have uh, an opportunity uh, to actually ask uh, questions. And this is highly encouraged. So you can use the Q&A uh, functionality. So there is a button at the bottom of your screen, you just have to press and it's a chat in which you can actually uh, write your questions. Uh, please uh, do not forget to mention uh, the name of uh, the person to whom you address uh, the question and also make the question as clear and concise uh, as possible. Uh, if for some reason we can not ask all questions, uh, we're going to basically transfer uh, the remaining ones on the next session, the, the meet uh, the speaker uh, session that is happening right after this uh, set of uh, presentation. So please uh, join as well this uh, session, uh, make it dynamic. So Natasha, if you could present like the first uh, speaker. Okay, so the first speaker that we have up in this genes and genome session is Abdullah Karaman. So he is uh, the leader of the clinical bioinformatics team at the University Hospital Zurich. And he is going to talk about the pathogenic impact of transcript isoform switching in 12,009 cancer samples, covering 27 cancer types using an isoform specific interaction network. So, without further ado, Abdullah, I'll let you share your screen. So, you can hear me and you can see my screen, right? Perfect. Yes. All right. It's not in presentation. Okay, there we go. All right. So I will make this up. All right. So um, thanks um, everyone for joining. Um, uh, so 110 people. That's a lot. Um, so really fantastic to have so many um, attendees here. Um, so yeah, I'm Abdullah Kahraman. Um, so I'm heading currently the clinical bioinformatics team in the Institute of Pathology and Molecular Pathology. And today I would like to talk about a project that I started off in the lab of Christian von Mering at the University of Zurich. Um, and in this project, we tried to assess the um, pathogenic impact of uh, alternative splicing disruptions in uh, 27 different uh, cancer types. And for that, we developed a new isoform specific interaction network. Um, because it's about alternative splicing, I mean, what I assume is that everyone knows uh, basically what alternative splicing is. So I will skip an introduction on alternative splicing, but I would like to mention here an interesting fact about alternative splicing, which is namely uh, under normal conditions, um, despite having all the different isoforms um, encoded in the genome, actually, when you look at the expression, it's usually just one single isoform uh, that is uh, most dominantly expressed. And uh, all the other isoforms, have actually very uh, low expression. Um, so, and this actually also um, uh, proceeds to other tissue types. And um, so even if you um, look into different tissue types, you always see the same uh, major isoform express. There are certain exceptions like in the brain, but um, the tendency is really that um, there's just one uh, functional major isoform uh, per gene. Now we can use this information now um, to assess the impact of alternative splicing in cancer and how um, can we do that? So 
we could um, simply identify the most dominant uh, transcripts in uh, normal conditions and compared to the most dominant transcripts um, in cancer conditions. And here, for example, we could um, assume that um, the most dominant transcript has to have at least twice as much expression as uh, the second most dominant uh, transcript. So um, if you um, have now this condition, uh, you can now look uh, for switches. So uh, for those uh, conditions where in normal condition, you would have um, um, the green transcript expressed uh, most dominantly, and in cancer now you have the blue um, um, transcript expressed uh, most dominantly. And uh, we would be now interested in our analysis um, to, um, to understand and to identify those uh, most dominant transcript uh, switches. But we had one additional actually um, requirement, um, which was uh, namely that um, the blue transcript on the right, that this blue transcript is really never the most dominant uh, transcript in any of the um, uh, in any of the normal samples uh, to which we compare uh, our cancer samples with. And if uh, this condition is also met, um, then we actually call uh, those most dominant transcripts cancer-specific most dominant transcripts because simply they were really very specific um, to um, that uh, cancer sample and uh, were not observed at all under normal conditions. Now, um, obviously, the first question is, yeah, so how frequent do we see those um, cancer-specific most dominant transcripts? And in order to analyze this and um, to get information on this, um, we joined uh, the Pan-Cancer Analysis of uh, Whole Genomes uh, project, which was initiated by the International Cancer Genomics Consortium. And this project was really fantastic uh, because we had lots of data available and uh, also available in advance. Um, so um, this uh, project, uh, the major papers got published in February, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, but we used the same um, data set. So, um, and what uh, type of data had we available? So first of all, we, ha um, we had 2,800 whole genome sequences available, so mutational information, and this um, over the entire genome. And uh, important for our project was um, that among uh, those 2,800 samples, we had 1,200 samples with RNA-seq expression data. And the RNA-seq expression data we could now use to assess which transcripts are most dominantly um, expressed. And um, the 1,200 um, 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 cancer samples with expression data, if you uh, split them into different cancer types, you can see that um, we were covering uh, more or less all primary tissue types. Um, so we had um, samples from uh, brain cancers, heart cancers, lung cancers, uh, kidney cancers, uh, prostate, and so on. Um, there was just one caveat, but this is true for most of the uh, consortium projects. Um, so um, the number of samples was imbalanced and that we had available for the different cancer types. And um, so we had uh, those cancer types with a very high number of samples like uh, kidney renal cell carcinomas. But then we had also those uh, samples uh, or cancer types where we just had a few uh, samples like cervix uh, adenocarcinomas. But nevertheless, uh, you know, it uh, was a fantastic resource um, where we could now perform our analysis. First, um, obviously, was the question how many uh, most dominant transcripts uh, could we actually identify? And um, what we, uh, I mean, the number that we identified in our case was that about 70% uh, of the genes have a um, transcript that is at least twice as much expressed as the second uh, most uh, dominantly um, uh, expressed uh, transcript. And if you now look at the cancer-specific most dominant transcripts, then you can see that um, in 7,100 um, genes, um, so which is about 36% of, um, of the genes um, that we have in the genome, um, so for those, uh, we could identify um, cancer-specific most of the uh, transcript. And in total, um, these were 122,000 uh, CMDTs. And yet at the bottom, I'm showing you here a uh, distribution of um, the various um, samples and, and the number of CMDTs. And um, so um, separated by the different cancer types and ordered by the median number of um, CMDTs. So it's a lot of data, but uh, just I just would like to point out certain things here. First of all, interestingly, so um, cancers of the cell that went in the mouth, um, I mean, the data set that we had available at least um, didn't have any um, alternative splicing disruptions. This was interesting. 
The second um, and third interesting point um, were on uh, melanoma samples. Uh, melanoma is usually a cancer type that is uh, one of the highly mutated uh, and really by far distance highly mutated cancer types. But here we see very few uh, um, alterations in alternative splicing. Um, brain cancers are also interesting because uh, the brain um, tissue is known um, to express different isoforms in contrast to other tissue types. But the brain usually expressed different isoforms from the same gene. Um, but here um, we also didn't see uh, much alterations in alternative splicing between normal conditions and, and um, the uh, brain cancer conditions. Um, interestingly, um, also for uh, lung cancers, um, the nice thing with our data set, we had subtype uh, information. So we had sub, uh, different subtypes of the um, cancers. And here, for example, we could compare the, um, the CMDT between adenocarcinomas of uh, the lung and squamous cell carcinomas. Squamous cell carcinomas are um, those cancers that are induced by smoking mostly, while adenocarcinomas can also be frequently found with non-smokers. So we have two different um, sets of, or two different um, carcinogens that are causing um, those um, um, cancer strokes. But nevertheless, um, the CMDTs um, uh, did not differ really uh, extensively. And if you look at the very right side, then you see actually um, the highest number of um, CMDT, so the highest number of disruptions in alternative splicing and um, could be observed with female reproductive organs. Um, so here, especially leading with uterus adenocarcinomas. Um, from all those CMDTs, um, 10 really stood out. And I'm listing here on those 10 because those 10 were not only um, uh, cancer-specific most of the transcripts, that were not observed in normal um, tissue, but they were also observed on all of the cancer samples that we analyzed. So really 100%, all of the samples that we analyzed, all of them had um, this isoform um, that was not um, being found in normal um, conditions. And uh, three in particular um, stand here really out. Um, so uh, those three were even not, were only found in the cancer type itself and not in any other cancer type. So these, these are really cancer type specific uh, um, most of the uh, transcripts. And those 10 are actually for us now potential diagnostic biomarker, uh, which we uh, really want to follow up now um, uh, next, uh, because these are transcripts that uh, could, you know, in uh, theory really be indicative of, um, of uh, cancerous growth um, in a patient. Um, um, yeah. So next is actually, um, so once we know uh, have the list of uh, CMDTs. Um, so the question now is, you know, um, do they have any impact? So what is the functional impact? Um, do they cause, for example, any pathogenicity? And I will come to that in a moment. So for that uh, reason, we actually um, um, uh, developed an isoform specific interaction network that was um, based on the string interaction network. And the string interaction network is the famous database um, that is um, developed by Christian von Mering and from Mering's lab. So we combined the string database basically with a three domain domain interaction database. And the idea here was very simple. So um, we have a, a transcript consists of different exons. So an exon can now transcribe a binding domain uh, where the binding domain is important for certain protein-protein interactions, as I'm showing you here with the red um, domain. And the red domain is important now to interact with this green uh, uh, protein here. Now, if you have now in cancer a transcript that is most of them expressed that lacks this red domain, so it, uh, it's spliced out, and then that protein will um, not be able or will not express the binding domain and will not be able to perform the interaction. So you will have an interaction loss. So in this isoform specific interaction network um, basically was now used to assess how extensive are uh, interaction losses observed with those uh, cancer-specific most of the transcripts, and um, uh, are those interaction losses somehow pathogenic? So, um, in terms of um, so, in um, to to put the number of interaction losses in context, uh, first um, again uh, the number seven thousand one hundred uh, cancer-specific most of the transcripts that we observed. From those 7,000 um, um, CMDTs, uh, 
unfortunately, um, we don't have high quality domain domain interaction information for most of them. So for 2,500 at least of those genes, we indeed had um, um, high quality domain domain interactions within the protein protein interaction network. So those we analyzed um, further and we could identify around in 55% of CMDTs that there are um, either all interactions lost or there are some interaction um, uh, or there are some interactions uh, lost due to the expression of um, this cancer specific monster uh, transcript. Um, the pathways and um, the molecular processes um, that are disrupted um, in those um, cases, um, we did an enrichment analysis um, using the, the geo molecular process terms. And it's like a heat map, but I just would like to um, uh, put your attention on the top six um, of those molecular processes that we find most often disrupt um, due to alternative splicing disruptions. And these are, um, I mean, they, they fit basically to alternative splicing. So here we see translational termination, which is affected in um, 22 of uh, the 27 cancer types. We see translation initia initiation transcription uh, nucleotide uh, biosynthesis uh, protein fold RNA splicing as those uh, processes that are most often um, disrupted by splicing induced um, uh, interaction disruptions. Um, in terms of pathogenicity, um, we wanted now, so now knowing which uh, interactions are lost, the next question is, you know, are these interactions somehow important for cancer? And here what we did is we um, used now the interaction um, network um, to, um, to measure between our instead. Sorry, uh, just one minute left, Abdullah. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, so uh, there's a CMDT um, basically for those um, genes and uh, the distance, we measure distance to known cancer-related genes and those cancer-related genes are, came from COSMIC and you can see most of the CMDTs are actually uh, either interaction partners or interaction or partners of um, interaction partners. So they're really related um, compared to a random uh, selection of, um, random selection of um, uh, uh, proteins. Unfortunately, in terms of mutation, didn't correlate much with uh, alternative splicing, but what we saw is we saw an enrichment in uh, CMDTs if you had the um, mutation in the spliceosome, as you can see here on the right. So with this, uh, the take home messages are uh, brain cancers and melanomas and uh, surprisingly have very little uh, CMDTs. Uh, female reproductive organs have high uh, CMDTs. And uh, prime, if you have the, if you, uh, if your cancer type are from the same primary tissue, then you tend to have similar CMDTs. Um, they induce 55% interaction losses, and um, very often, actually, the interaction partners are cancer-related. And uh, if, you are, if you have a spliceosome patient, you have a higher number of CMDTs. And I would like to point out here a poster where uh, Tulai uh, Karakulak, my PhD student, will uh, present further information, and you can also um, uh, get on my uh, GitHub account to get the code for, uh, for the analysis, and the preprint is available on my archive. And with this, I would like to thank Christian, uh, Tulai, Damian uh, for the help and the man uh, for the superb environment, and Josh, uh, Yuri, and um, from the PIPA project um, for all the constant help. And with this, I'm um, done. And if you have one or two questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah, thank you, Abdullah, for uh, your very nice presentation, a very impressive piece of work. So we don't have much time for a question for this first uh, talk. Maybe I'm going to just ask uh, uh, a quick one that has been uh, upvoted. So from Antonin Thiebaud. So you found cancer types uh, specific CMDT, but on the opposite, did you also find any CMDT common to a majority of cancer that would maybe, that could maybe even be used as uh, global cancer markers? Um, so let me da, 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 let me think. Um, I mean, this this analysis. I mean, I didn't look this up in particular, um, but we could uh, check this up. But I don't remember seeing one that really was found in all of the cancer types. Um, here's also like a balance. Would you like to have one 
the thing is, um, the interesting uh, CMDTs are the biomarkers, so that really appear in all of the cancer, uh, of a certain cancer type. And this is now put in contrast then to a CMDT that might not be found in all of the cancer types, but that is found in different, uh, in all the different cancer types. In few cases, one needs to balance this out, but there is none that really that was found in all of the um, cancer types. I guess it's my job to introduce the next speaker, uh, Jeremy Breda from the University of Basel, going to talk about uh, realizing the Waddington metaphor, inferring regulatory landscape from single cell expression data. So the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. And um, so first, thank the SID for accepting my my, uh, my talk. Um, so I'm Jeremy Breda from the groups of Mihala Zavalan and Eric van den Wegen at the Biocentral University of Basel. Um, so the sort of question we're interested in in the group concerned the high variability of cell that we can see in the higher eukaryotes. And in particular, I was interested in um, how cell types are defined, established and stabilized. So to approach such questions, uh, Waddington introduced uh, his famous analogy in 1957 where um, stem cells are compared to marble rolling down a landscape and following valleys. So analogously, um, the gene expression of cell would be guided by an epigenetic landscape and cell would uh, develop uh, through differentiation time, developmental time until they reach, uh, reach stable minima that uh, we then call cell types. So I wanted to see how far we could go with this analogy, try to give it a uh, rigorous meaning, and um, try to infer such a structure from single cell RNA sequencing data. So um, from physics, we know that uh, every system can be characterized from uh, an energy function. And uh, so in that case, due to this, uh, in the study system, due to the high degree of freedom and the uh, inherent stochasticity, uh, we we can use the well-developed framework of statistical physics, which states that uh, the probability to find a system in a given state, uh, knowing only the energy of state, is given by the maximal entropy distribution, known as the Boltzmann distribution. So uh, what this uh, equation says is that uh, an energy of state defines the density of state and vice versa. So if we can estimate measure density, of uh, gene expression in a, a cell in uh, the space of gene expression, we can infer landscape. And uh, so this landscape would have different application, like defining a cell type as local minima, defining a differentiation path as a um, valley of the landscape, and would allow us to ask what's the minimal perturbation needed to bring a cell from one state to another, similarly to an activation energy in a chemical reaction. So. Uh, as I said, we want to infer such structure from a single cell RNA sequencing, but there's a caveat in that um, the number of, I mean, what RNA sequencing, uh, RNA, uh, single cell RNA sequencing measure is not exactly gene expression, but a uh, number of mRNA per gene and per cell. So let's take a gene with a constant transcription rate and a constant decay rate. Um, so it's expected expression is going to be the ratio of those two rates and i'm going to call that transcription activity and now um, that's only an expected number but due to the biochemical process of transcription and decay we accept we accept that uh, the number of counts in a cell is going to follow poisson distribution with that transcription activity as a mean uh, on top of that in the protocol of single cell rna sequencing only a small fraction of the Total mRNA is captured, so adding another layer of sampling. Uh, but uh, fortunately, the combination of those two Poisson process stays Poisson, uh, with the mean being this transcription activity times the, the capture probability. Um, and then finally, we of course uh, don't expect the transcription and decay to be constant across cell. We expect uh, heterogeneity in the transcription activity. Um, so. In, in other words, the total variance that we're going to measure in, in uh, the MR account is going to be the sum of two terms, the Poisson var uh, um, the variance uh, due to Poisson noise that uh, doesn't have um, interesting biological meaning. 
in that case and the, the variance of the transcription activity that we want to keep. So to, to solve that problem, we developed a Bayesian model that removes that Poisson noise. And to do so, we first estimate um, the mean and the variance in the transcription activity for each gene. And then in each cell, we uh, estimate the transcription activity in each cell uh, separately. So we, we made that uh, algorithm available in a, in a GitHub page. And we detailed uh, the derivation and uh, made a, a benchmarking in this uh, preprint. Uh, so let me show you one of the main results. So as I said, the main goal of this method is to remove the, the Poisson noise. So to test this ability, we took a, a set of mouse marine stem cell consisting of 80 single cells and 80 aliquots. So the aliquots were uh, smartly designed uh, by pulling together the mRNA, con mRNA content of a uh, several cell and then sampling back a uh, single cell equivalent content of uh, mRNA. And the nice thing with those aliquots is that by construction, they have only Poisson noise. And this Poisson noise is uh, well characterized by the strong negative dependence between the coefficient of variance and the mean. So if we first look at simply the row count without doing anything, um, you, you still see this strong dependence of the CV on the mean. Now, uh, a common normalization in, uh, for bulk RNA sequencing is the transcripts per million, which uh, kind of normalize for differences in uh, sequencing depth per sample and per cell in that case. And uh, as we expect, uh, the, this dependence is not removed. Now, as I said, we, we benchmarked with uh, several other normalization methods. And um, so those are the different methods we tested. And um, they removed this uh, dependence to some extent, but only uh, sanity, which is here in the middle, uh, almost completely removed that uh, dependence while at the same time finding the same very low base level of variance for both the single cell and the adequates, as we would expect. Okay, so we believe that, uh, I mean, with its uh, sanity, we have a good estimation of a density of cell in a space of gene expression with, with its transcription activity. So we can go back to our problem, how to infer this uh, landscape. So let's think at what this uh, epigenetic energy can be. And in, uh, so in 1957, when Waddington introduced this idea, he imagined that this uh, landscape would come from a complex system of interaction underlying the epigenetic landscape that would be due to the chemical tendencies with uh, gene producers. So in fact, we don't want to infer this landscape in the whole space of gene expression, but only in the space of uh, regulators, gene regulators. So to do this, uh, to, to do that, to infer the, the state of regulators, we used a model that was developed in the group of Eric van Wegen about a decade ago called MARAS and involved motif activity response analysis. So very quickly, what this model does is to first predict a binding site of transcription factor on the promoter of the genes and a binding site of microRNA on, three, on the three prime end from UTR of the, the transcript. And then it uh, interprets uh, gene expression as a linear combination of the number of motif uh, on that uh, gene times the activity of the corresponding motif. So it uses predicted uh, binding sites and observes gene expression to infer a uh, motif activity per cell. Okay, so. Um, now we can reconstruct this landscape and one of the first uh, applications that arise is that it uh, defines cell type as a local minima. Uh, so to do so, we start from uh, the estimated regulatory activity of each cell. We follow the constructed landscape descending down the gradients until we reach uh, a minimum. Uh, then each minimum we call it a cell type and we assign each cell type to the valley it's uh, located in. So we applied this framework on a published data set of 2,000 um, human pancreas cell. So here I show you each uh, point, each cell projected uh, in the first three principal component of that space. So we applied that framework and uh, we could retrieve the uh, main known uh, types of uh, pancreatic cells. I show you in different colors here. 
uh, now each of those cell type has a precise location in uh, the space of uh, gene regulators. So we could ask which regulators most distinguish those different types. And I show you here those different uh, factors projected uh, in that same space. And we could corroborate from literature um, that those factors as important regulators of pancreatic cells. Um, another one last um, more complex and dynamic example. Uh, we considered a mouse embryonic stem cell during neurogenesis. So in an experiment made in collaboration by Tangzila Mukhtar from the group of Verdon Taylor in the Department of Biomedicine uh, in Basel. So um, she fact sorted some uh, neural stem cell at day 13.5 from uh, uh, the, the forebrain cortex of mouse. So the, the forebrain cortex of both human and mouse uh, are uh, created in several successive layers of distinct neurons. And those neurons come from the, as the asymmetric division of neural stem cell. Those neural stem cell can also undergo symmetric division and proliferate to give rise to more neural stem cells. So again, we apply this framework, infer that landscape, and I show you here this landscape uh, projected on the first two principal components. And you can see a sort of main valley connecting different minima shown in red. So I, uh, I constructed the minimal energy path connecting those different uh, minima, where a minimal energy path is uh, defined as a path connecting any two points of the landscape along which the energy is minimized. So we have a path that is defined in the whole space of uh, gene regulators. Again, so we can ask which gene are most variable along that path. I show you here the top 16 most variable uh, motif, and you can see sort of uh, three groups of gene having similar behavior. Now, uh, each of those factors, they have predicted gene targets, so I could do uh, gene ontology analysis on those uh, target genes and ask what biological process are, are being regulated by those factors. And you can see a first group that is uh, highly active on the right hand part of the, the, the trajectory, which are all uh, related to neuronal differentiation process. Another group of e 2 factor high in the middle, uh, which are related to a S phase, DNA replication, and finally uh, a few genes high on the left hand part which are all related to mitosis. So this uh, correspond to the, what is known about the system, which is that those neural stem cells undergo asymmetric division. So cells uh, stay in a cell cycle and proliferate or can um, alternatively undergo uh, asymmetric division, give rise to basal progenitors that can turn a further differentiate towards different neuron types. Okay, so to summarize, um, First, uh, showed you here a Bayesian model to remove the Poisson noise and infer this transcription activity from a single cell RNA sequencing data. And I show you how to map this transcription activity to a space of a regulatory activity for each cell. And finally, I showed you a few simple examples on how to, uh, how to use this, reconstru uh, this constructed landscape to define cell type as local minima identify uh, regulators that distinguish those different cell types and uh, finally identify developmental paths with uh, uh, associated regulators. So with that, uh, I want to thank my supervisors, Michaela Zavolan and Eric van Nienwegen, as well as uh, both, their, both their groups, and thank you for uh, attending and listening. Great, thank you, Jeremy, for that nice talk. So I think we have time for one or two questions. So let me see in the chat here. Um, there. Okay, here's one from Pierre Luc Germain. Oh, I'll just ask one of them. He said, "How reasonable is it to take density into the gene expression space as a proxy for stability?" In particular, doesn't the abundance of the cell type influence density in a way that doesn't relate to stability? I mean, I would assume that uh, 
uh, no matter how big, uh, okay, if we take one cell type, we assume that we have a group of cells that have all the same uh, state. Um, I guess that the, so the stability is gonna be defined by how, you know, how heterogeneous they are in their minima. And I think that should not be, that should not depend on the principle on the number of, um, of cell that we have in that group. So I assume that, uh, I mean, the more cell we have, the more precise we have, we're gonna be, but the, the kind of shape of this landscape around uh, a minima defined by a group of cells, I think should not, I mean, in the limit where we have a really low number of cell, uh, uh, then I guess we won't be precise. We probably need a few cells, but uh, Otherwise, I guess we can estimate a sort of uh, uh, variance from uh, any number of cells. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe just one more quick one that's kind of general. Uh, this one's from Frederick Bastian. He asks, if I'm only interested in determining cell types, what is the added value of your method as compared to simply using expression of a few marker genes? I mean, I guess you could also try to infer a, a, a landscape uh, in the, the space of uh, transcription activity, but then I, I, I also believe that there would be other method that works better to, to kind of cluster the cells in this one. I guess the, the added value would be that uh, I mean, the additional information at least would be that uh, the, those cell types are defined in a space of regulators. So you could ask which uh, transcription factor or microRNA are distinguishing the different cell types uh, ra rather than how those cell types are different in terms of uh, gene expression. Okay, thank you. And um, so with that, I will wrap up this session on genes and genomes. So I want to say thank you again to the four really interesting talks from the speakers this morning. And um, also thanks for all the attendees to, to join this, this session. And now that it's over, um, all of the audience members, if you want, you can now join the Meet the Speaker session. So all of the questions that were, that you put in the chat that we didn't get a time get the time to answer they will be answered in that session so you can just join that by leaving the current session and then clicking on the camera symbol next to the q a session of the genes and genomes and also um if also uh, about the uh, questions that get unanswered there is a slack ch uh, channel created called follow-up discussion. So follow-up, one word, then dash, tire, discussion. So this is a channel you can also post some follow-up questions to the speakers. But for now, we'll be in the meet the speaker room. So I think that's it, unless I miss something, Olivier, but... No, no, I think it's, it's, it's all good. We can actually go on those are uh, virtual. So okay. everybody. And Thank you. Yep.